Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. I'm Marcus Grodi, your host for this program. Uh, just in case you're new to The Journey Home each week, uh, I have this wonderful opportunity to sit with you to hear the story of how the Holy Spirit opened the hearts and minds of men and women, drawing them to a deeper relationship of, with Christ in the church. And often that's a journey they didn't anticipate whatsoever. Some of, some of our guests come from denominations that are very close to the Catholic Church and her tradition. Others come from radically different, at least in some areas of theology. And, and that's a little bit like our guest tonight, uh, who's returning to the Journey Home program, Mark McNeil. He comes from a former oneness Pentecostal uh, denomination. I don't know if you called yourself denomination. I don't think you did. Probably association. Uh, probably one of those churches that saw themselves as non-denominational. So his conversion story is on the Coming Home Network website, chnetwork.org. But uh, it's, well, it's good to have you back, Mark. Good, good to be here, Mark. Good to have you back. And you've got, uh, you know, of course, one of the, uh, I think, reasons, flags that came up to remind us about your gifts and invite you back is you've got a new book coming out called uh, All in the Name, how uh, was how I was led to the faith in the Trinity and the Catholic Church, right? That's right. So we'll probably talk about that later in the program. I'm guessing there are a lot of people watching that are, are not familiar with the distinctions of the oneness Pentecostals. Mm -hmm. uh, they may know there's a Pentecostal church down the street, mm -hmm. but it hasn't struck them that there's a, an underlying major difference in the way they understand God mm -hmm. from the majority of us. So that's good to uh, come back and address that. But let me get out of the way. I sure. invite you to remind us of your story. Well, thank you. Thank you so much for having me back. Um, I appreciate so much the work you do. And um, uh, since being on here, it's, it, it seems a lifetime ago in many ways. <laughs> uh, I've been working in a Catholic school and, um, you know, just just busy about trying to live the Catholic faith. And so as the years go on, my story, you know, in some ways, it grow. It's part of me always, yeah. uh, but in some ways, it's uh, being immersed in the life of the church. It seems so distant. Uh, but going back and recalling my story, uh, I didn't grow up in the Catholic Church. Uh, I, I really, in my earliest years in life, didn't go to any church uh, mm -hmm. until uh, my sister and I, I have a little bit older sister and a much younger brother. Uh, when we got uh, into elementary school, I think our parents started feeling bad that they weren't giving us any religious background. <laughs> And so they said, Have they not had any themselves? They well, my, become... my mother grew up a Catholic, actually. Uh, her family immigrated to the United States after the Second World War, okay. shortly after she was born. And uh, they were from Poland. And so everybody there is a Catholic, at least yep. uh, in, their, in their history. And my dad actually was, uh, his family was connected to the early Pentecostal movement in the 20th century. My great grandfather was a minister in the Methodists and went over to the Assemblies of oh, God. Okay. And, uh, and one of the early forms of Pentecostalism. And so my parents, I guess, to keep peace in the home and whatever was going on in their own religious journey, uh, they didn't go to church anywhere in those early years. Mm -hmm. And uh, so they started sending us off to a Sunday school uh, at a little Baptist church. And it was there that I first learned about Christ and the love of God for the world. And I had a growing sense of my own sinfulness and my, uh, the story of God's love for us uh, uh, transformed me as a boy and so I fell in love with it and uh, so we kind of bounced around several different churches in the in the next number of years uh, not because we were you know uh, committed to any particular form of Christianity it was just really where we were located physically uh, we'd go to the nearest church by and uh, so but at a certain point when I was in high school I ran into uh, or got to be friends with a young man at the high school that I went to who had just gotten involved with this Pentecostal church uh, and I was uh, just absorbing whatever I could learn of religious faith. And, and so uh, I went to a youth meeting at his church, and it turned out to be a oneness Pentecostal church. Uh, the particular organization is called the United Pentecostal Church. And uh, it was there that I first came in contact with their teachings and their ideas. And so it's a, it's a kind of a complicated web of ideas, but if I could, if I could just get to the heart of it, I think... Um, uh, the minister that I sat down with, a uh, dynamic, very knowledgeable man, uh, he sat down with me and he explained to me their ideas. And the way he did it was this. He said, uh, he asked if I believe in the Trinity. And I said, yes, I believe in the Trinity. I knew enough at that point yeah. to know that, that that's what I'm supposed to say. 
And so he uh, uh, proceeded to say, well, the Trinity is not in the Bible. And he said, the Word's not in the Bible, the Trinity, the Word, uh, nor are other terms that are used to try to expl express what the Trinity is. And uh, he proceeded to explain to me that the Bible doesn't teach the Trinity. The Bible teaches instead uh, what I came to discover later was a kind of modalism. Uh, that God is, uh, when we speak of God as Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, uh, that doesn't mean that God is three persons. That means that God just has three different functions uh, in relationship to human beings. In fact, he even went on to say that uh, the three functions of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, there's nothing magical or special about those three. God does lots of different things, and so God has lots of titles or names, mm. but they're not divine persons. And so he explained it this way. Uh, you are a father, a son, and a husband, he would, he would say about himself. I'm a father, a son, and a husband. Uh, and uh, he said, I have all these roles, but I'm a single person. And that's what Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are like. God is creator, that means he's father, he's son, he's redeemer. Uh, he's Holy Spirit because he sanctifies us and lives within us. And so God has these three functions or these three activities, uh, but he's only one person. And all these people teaching the Trinity this idea that God is three divine persons from all eternity are just wrong. Mm -hmm. Now, what captivated me with that initially is, first of all, it makes sense. Yeah. You know, it's easy to understand. Easier. Easier yeah. to yeah. understand, yeah. for sure. It's much easier to understand than uh, traditional presentations of the Trinity. Uh, and, uh, and associated with that was this idea that we're to be baptized in the name of Jesus only. Uh, so that was another one of their ideas. Uh, and so as I learned later about their history, I learned that first the Pentecostal movement had supposedly discovered this idea that we should be baptized in the name of Jesus only. And out of that came a questioning of the Trinity. Uh, so mm. these ideas were presented to me and I, I latched on to them. Uh, I learned about them and then I uh, you know, became a convert to this movement. I was, uh, uh, you know, saw myself as a defender of these ideas and I wanted to be a preacher of these ideas. And so when I graduated from high school, uh, I went to one of our Bible colleges for three years and my goal was to spend my life teaching these ideas in, uh, in one of our schools or in our churches or however I could. Uh, while I was at the college, though, uh, I uh, came across a number of books that affected me profoundly. Uh, one of them was a collection of the church fathers, especially the anti-Nicene fathers, those before the Council of Nicaea. Our view of church history, Marcus, was that uh, around the year 325, everything went down the tubes. Uh, that Emperor Constantine changed everything, and prior to the Council of Nicaea, people believed like we did. Uh, and that after Nicaea, it all uh, fell apart. And so when I read the writings of the earliest fathers of the church, I found that they were very dissimilar to what we taught. Uh, and they too talked about God in ways that sounded more like the Trinity than, than like what we taught. Uh, so in time, that bothered me. And I came across also works of theology that presented in a more systematic and clear way uh, the idea of the Trinity. And it started challenging my way of reading the Bible. Uh, and so in time, by the time I got to my senior year at the school, uh, I was uh, going through a kind of crisis of faith because we only trusted the Bible. And I found that there were honest people who could read the Bible in a very different way than I did. Uh, and they were much smarter than I was and they were much more learned than I was. And so I, I came to this great challenge of uh, how am I going to deal with this fact that that uh, I read the Bible in one way and there are other people that are just as devout and just as sincere and just as knowledgeable or more so and they don't read the Bible the way that I do. Mm. Uh, that created a crisis of authority. Who reads the Bible and tells us what it means accurately? Mm. Uh, it uh, brings to mind several years later, I was uh, after I had finally left the Oneness Pentecostal movement, I was standing on the steps of uh, the, uh, the tower at the University of Texas with a group of apologists defending our version of Protestant evangelicalism at that time. And uh, a young lady came up to the microphone and she pointed at me and she said, I want to know why I should believe your version of Christianity uh, because there are lots of people who come out here and tell us their versions. Why should I believe yours? Uh, and she pointed directly at me. And I'm sure I blabbered a bunch of different things, but the three hour drive home back to Houston that night uh, that tormented me, the question of why should anybody listen to me? Uh, and it struck me as I had learned about the fathers of the church and I'd learned a little bit about Catholic theology and their understanding of the church, it struck me that in the Catholic tradition, it's not people should listen to it because I say it. 
They should listen to it because we say it, because the whole tradition says it, because down through the centuries there's a common voice that speaks about who God is and what God's plan is for the world. And, uh, and so the, the, the Catholic faith became more and more interesting to me. And I'll add one other thing uh, uh, to the summary of my story is that uh, around that time when I had left the Oneness Pentecostal movement, really over a crisis of authority, who reads the Bible and, and gives us an accurate understanding of what it means, I went over to uh, St. Mary Seminary in Houston, the Catholic seminary there. Mm -hmm. The University of St. Thomas runs a theology program there. And there was a priest, a very devout priest there, uh, Father uh, James Anderson, Monsignor now, James Anderson. Uh, he had studied the Gregorian in Rome. He's a very devout and pious priest. And I sat in a class of his on the Trinity. And the richness and beauty of the tradition that came through that class just overwhelmed me. Up to that point, it was really about arguing verses of Scripture. Uh, at this point, I saw how the tradition gives to us a whole vision for life and transformation of life uh, through the, the contents of our faith. Uh, and so the, uh, the Catholic faith became much more beautiful to me. I would say that really my becoming a Catholic in time was because I saw its beauty and its riches uh, more so than this argument or that argument. It was the richness of it and also the practicality of it. The Catholic faith sees, for example, in the mystery of the Trinity, it sees the key to how to think about all of life. Uh, you know, none of us, you know, uh, recently I was thinking of this, um, you know, the most painful moments in our lives are usually when relationships are broken and we lose somebody to death. Uh, those are the most painful moments in our lives. Uh, there's a reason for that. The reason for that deep pain is because we're made for a relationship. We're not complete alone. You know, the first negative words God says about his creation is, it's not good that man should be alone. Mm -hmm. And we're made in the image and likeness of God. And so we're made for communion. We're made for relationship. We're made for love. And that insight is rooted ultimately in the nature of God, that God is supreme love that God is infinite happiness because of eternal relationship that exists in God. And so the mystery of the Trinity became for me, with the help of the Catholic tradition, it became the uh, really the core and center of everything that I believe and think. I hope that makes a little bit of sense, Mark. Oh, no, that, that's uh, great. You know. Our guest is Mark McNeil. Uh, no, that's, I've got a number of questions and, and to clarify that a question might be in the in the minds of some of our audience. It seems to me that that as you mentioned, you didn't realize it when you were one as Pentecostal. But what in in essence was being drummed up here again was an old heresy, mm -hmm. uh, and there are many heresies like that in the early days of the church, as well-meaning thinkers, sincere thinkers, were trying to deal with mystery. Mm -hmm. I mean, really deal with, and the mysteries are often in Scripture. Sometimes they seem like contradictions. Yeah. How do I understand that? Yeah. Uh, trying to understand how, um, uh, like, I was thinking, just happened to read this morning, partially as I was preparing, uh, knowing that you and I were going to sit on this thing, is Cornelius's conversion in Acts chapter 10, yeah. um, when Peter make statements like, um, uh, you know the word which he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace by the word which he sent by Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, the word which was proclaimed throughout the Judea, beginning with Galilee, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit mm -hmm. and with power. How God anointed Jesus with the Holy Spirit. Well, mm -hmm. how do we deal with these three? Mm -hmm. I mean, there you could see some took that to mean adoptionism, mm -hmm. that God chose this human being and gave him the Holy Spirit. to make, so That's where adoptionism mm -hmm. came from. Mm -hmm. How do you deal with that later after um, Peter recognizes that the Holy Spirit had fallen on Cornelius and these non-Jews He's, they were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. And so Peter declared, can anyone forbid water from baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit? And he recommended them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. 
Well, the Great Commission back in Matthew 28 was baptizing them in the name of the Father. So, so mm -hmm. the point is well-meaning people mm -hmm. trying to put this together. Mm -hmm. And often it's, how do you deal with mystery? How do you deal with seeming contradiction? Mm -hmm. And in, you look back, was the oneness Pentecostals just one way of trying to come up with a human way to explain these mysteries? Sure. I think it's, it, you know, there's an experience that they have and they go to the Bible out of that experience and they read all of its contents that way. It's it, it, one, of the, one of the things that I discovered, and you can do this with not only oneness Pentecostalism, but with the Jehovah's Witnesses or with Mormons or with all different forms of, of religious expression, is typically what happens is they latch on to one particular insight and then they organize everything else around that insight. Uh, and so it's almost as if you create, as they say, a canon within a canon. So this, this becomes my authority and then everything else revolves around that. And so it is with one that's Pentecostalism. And, and you're absolutely right. Uh, that the, you can find the basis for all the different heresies in verses of Scripture taken in isolation. Uh, but taken in isolation, meaning by that, you take those verses of Scripture and they become the normative text around which you organize everything else. So this text, for example, distinguishes between God and the man Christ Jesus and the Holy Spirit given to him. Uh, so you mentioned adoptionism. You know, in, in the New Testament, there's plenty of reason to support Jesus being a man. He really was a man. And there's plenty to support our belief that he was divine, that he's God. Uh, but in the early church, in the early centuries, and it's still the same today, uh, people uh, take one of those truths and try to understand it, in some cases, in isolation from other texts, or they run with it because they're trying to trying to expel the mystery, as you mentioned. Uh, and so if I take the humanity of Christ and say, I'm going to take that seriously so he can't be God, or I'm going to do the other, he's God, and or he's divine, so he can't really be human. And out of that comes a dozen different heresies. Yeah. You know, uh, docetism over here, he only looks like a man, he only seems to be a man. Over here, you know, all the different ebionism and so on, where Jesus is only human. And, uh, and, so, and then you've got attempts to try to merge those two together, oftentimes failing, you know, Apollinarianism. Jesus is two-thirds man and one-third God. Uh, and so you, you, in some ways, compromise his real humanity. Uh, and so there's all these different isms of the early centuries of the church. And again, they keep resurfacing. And I remember in my oneness Pentecostal days, in, in some ways it, it's humorous, it's sad in another way, that I actually on my own repeated most of those heresies in my own bedroom, reading the Bible and trying to figure out how to make it, you know, fit it all together without the light of the tradition and without the insight into the mystery as you, as you speak of it. Uh, and so without that guidance and that insight, I fell into almost every one of those heresies on my own. Uh, it really, really rather, rather remarkable. Yeah. And, and you mentioned uh, baptism in the name of Jesus Christ here. That's another fantastic example of this. You know, I, I've sat down with many of my oneness Pentecostal friends from the past, the ones that would continue to speak with me, and they would challenge me on this point because they feel so confident in it. They look at a text yeah. like that, and it says that they were baptized in the name of the Lord or the Lord Jesus or Lord Jesus Christ. And there's a number of instances of this in the book of Acts in particular. In Acts chapter 2 and 8 and 10 and 19 are the primary ones. And, uh, and so I've sat down with friends of mine and I asked them this question about these verses. I say, well, in that text, they insist, it says they were baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And I say, well, tell me what the text says was said when they were baptized. What are the words that Peter says when he baptizes it doesn't tell us what he said when he baptizes them. So what does it mean to do something in the name of the Lord? What does it mean to do something in the name of Christ? I mean, the, the book title, All in the Name, alludes to Paul's words in Colossians 3. Do everything that you do in the name of the Lord, whether in word or in deed. And so the question is, what does it mean to do something in the name of Christ? Uh, does that merely refer to what we say? Well, apparently not, because in the book of Acts, there's a story of the seven sons of Sceva who say, we, bat, we adjure you in the name of Jesus whom Paul preaches to come out of him to the demons that were in a man. The demons couldn't care less. They attacked the, the man. And, uh, and so just saying the words is not necessarily doing it in his name. Uh, it's doing it by his authority and his place, uh, pointing to him, building on him. Actually, if I, if I can make one quick point about those texts in the book of Acts, if you take Acts 2 and 8 and 10 and 19, this was a remarkable discovery for me. Uh, if you take those texts, 
they are not as unified as it might seem on the surface. For example, in, and I'll make a little technical point here, in Acts chapter 2, verse 38, where Peter says, repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. The word that's used, that's translated as the word in, in our, in our English translations, is a Greek preposition, epi. Epi means on. It's the word that would be used if I were to put something on this cup. I would say on top of it, it would be epi. Uh, the sense would be there. Baptize, building on Christ, founding mm. yourself on Jesus. Uh, in Acts chapter 8, however, it says be baptized in the Greek preposition there is ace. It's a different word. It means directing attention to, pointing to Christ. Direct attention to Him. In Acts chapter 10, it's a different word. It's the Greek preposition in, which means within the sphere of. <laughs> be baptized within the context of Christ. In other words, each of these texts are giving us some insight into how baptism brings us into a relationship with Jesus. We build our lives on Him. We point toward Him. We move toward Him. We live within Him. All of these baptismal expressions are not formulas, I would submit. They're not formulas. They're telling us that baptism brings us into a relationship with Christ. Now, Jesus tells us in Matthew 28, baptize in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. The word he uses there is ace, point to, make reference to, direct attention to, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And make one other quick point on that, if you don't mind. Uh, no, this in, is excellent, Mark. In, in, <laughs> in Acts chapter 19, the final one of those texts, Paul comes across a group of disciples uh, and he, of John the Baptist. They'd been baptized by John. And now Paul comes across them and he says, did you receive the Holy Spirit when you came to believe? And they said, uh, we don't know that there is a Holy Spirit. It seems the sense of it is, you know, John had baptized, pointing people to the Messiah who would baptize people with the Holy Spirit. And they said, we don't know that the Holy Spirit has come yet. They had not been informed about Christ. So he then asked this question. It's a, a fascinating question. Paul says, unto what then were you baptized? Unto what then were you baptized? They said, we don't know that there is a Holy Spirit. Well, what did your baptism point to? And he uses the word ace. What did your baptism direct you to? If you don't know about the Holy Spirit, you should know about the Holy Spirit <laughs> if you've been baptized properly. And so when Jesus said to baptize in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, he told us to point to the Holy Spirit. Paul knew that if they didn't know about the Holy Spirit, they had not received Christian baptism because Christian baptism makes reference to the Holy Spirit. Those kinds of texts, you know, that, that showed me or helped me to see, they put a crack in the, in the sort of armor of our theology that it's not so clear after all. It seemed clear to us because we were operating within our insulated world of thinking about these texts. We look at these texts, baptized in the name of Jesus Christ, it's as clear as day. You look a little more carefully, it's not as clear as day. That it, and so the assumption of it is these are giving to us a formula. I don't think they're given to us a formula because they vary in key terms uh, and, and that, that create a different sense of what the text is talking about. So, but it goes back to your point, and, and I think one of the things that draws many of us to Catholicism is I can sit across the table from well-meaning oneness Pentecostals or a well-meaning Mormon or a well-meaning, you know, whatever. I can sit across the table from them and they in all sincerity uh, will say, I see it this way. And I will say, no, I see it this way. And in the Catholic tradition, we say, we see it this way with the voice of all the centuries. And we've already had these battles. And the, and the church gives to us that sort of context of the tradition to help us know what the text is saying. I, it, have you found it to be the same, Mark, that in your years as a Catholic, I have found uh, the, the more I'm a Catholic, I, I, I say it's funny, the, I suppose, the more stupid I realize I am. In other words, <laughs> it, it, a real need to grow in humility. Of course. The whole way. They're, it's really important. Yeah. And uh, as we study the early church fathers, we study the catechism, we study Aquinas or Augustine or any of these thinkers, we stand in awe, not just of their intellect, but of their humility, mm. standing before the mystery mm. of the Eucharist, mm. the mystery of the Incarnation, the mystery of the Trinity. Mm. And maybe to me, uh, I've come to discover all these years, the biggest mystery of all is the mystery of the church. Mm. You know, we, we look at us. Mm. When we joined the church, it didn't become holier. Maybe we mm. did when you became, <laughs> but it's still, mm. it's one holy mm. apostolic and Catholic church, the, the mystery of that. You were mentioning a great mystery even 
in being in Christ. Hmm. You know, what does Paul mean by that? He says, he says it a gazillion times. Hmm. Anyone who is in Christ. But what does that mean? How does one get in Christ? How does one stay in Christ? And you know, a thousand opinions across the table of well-meaning people. How do I, as a, as a Catholic, continue to grow hmm. in Christ? And I'm wondering, if maybe we're going to talk more about that when we come back, but before the break, you know, oneness Pentecostal, what did it mean to be in Jesus? Was that all that it was to be in Christ? This, this one uh, relationship with God had many faces? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a fantastic question. We didn't, the language of being in Christ uh, was not common, as I recall. We <laughs> didn't use that language frequently. We, we, you know, we would refer to the same text that everybody else would about you know, Paul's teaching about us being members of the body of Christ. And so there was a, a sense of a, we, didn't, we wouldn't use the language of mystical union, but there was a sense that there's, there's something that, that unites us together, that Christ somehow dwells within us, and, uh, and that creates a kind of link or bond between all the members of Christ's body. Uh, but uh, there wasn't a seriously worked out understanding of that. Okay. I, I, I'm, I have a, a thought, I assume we need to take a break soon, but, but uh, maybe, maybe one of the things that you mentioned was, you know, how has, how has my subsequent Catholic experience sort of, uh, affected all those things or affected the way that I see them? And um, uh, one of the things that, that comes to mind is what you alluded to, that, that even the greatest minds of our tradition uh, are people that had this deep sense of humility. And Aquinas is yeah. a great example who, you know, he, before the Blessed Sacrament, he has some kind of experience and he sees his writing. And he sees everything that he'd written as straw, you know, that it's yeah. just so much yeah. words and in comparison to the reality. Uh, not that we don't need the words, but that, but that there's something that transcends all of our words and it's this ultimate union with God. And so these great, great theologians of the past, these great minds of our tradition, uh, who had such an experience. I've, I've developed a great affection for Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Society of Jesus, because I work in a Jesuit institution. Uh, but more than that, uh, my own sort of encounter with his approach to the life of prayer and, and reading scripture and journeying through life with Christ. Uh, and even he, you know, he describes this experience he had in a little town of Manresa in Spain by the Cardinal River. He's looking down there one day, and he was a hard-headed you know, uh, you know, sort of self-consumed young man and very stubborn. And he slowly learns. He's, he's a, someone that I think we can all relate to, just a stubborn, hard-headed guy <laughs> that God gets his attention by bringing him to, to the, the, the brink of death. Uh, and he finds Christ in a powerful way on his recovery bed. And now he just wants to do whatever he can for the kingdom of God. But he has this experience, and this is what he's getting to, while he's looking down at the Cardinal River, there in Spain, he's look, from Manresa, he's looking down, he says there's a moment in which he has this infusion of insight that he, he doesn't even want to talk about. In fact, he didn't want to talk about himself at all. Uh, his, his companions kept bugging him, tell us your story, tell us your story, tell us your story. And he's about to die before, within a few years, and he's sick and, and aging. And he says, oh, yeah, yeah, I'll tell you my story. And he does, never does. And they keep bugging him and bugging him and bugging him. Finally, he tells a story, and we have, fortunately, his autobiographical reflections that were written down. Uh, relatively brief, but he has this experience there by the river where he says in that one moment he saw more than he had seen his whole life and ever since then, uh, and he saw how, and I'm not going to pretend to understand what he saw, but he saw how it all fits together as a manifestation of the glory of God, that all of creation and all that is speaks to us of God. And in that moment of infused insight, uh, I think you had the, the, the formation of a truly humble man because he knew I couldn't replicate this with my own learning in the rest of my life, that in that moment I had an encounter with God and what I saw, I can't even tell you. It was so great. Uh, so anyway, and I think there's lots of great stories like that among the saints. I, it, this, I, it, the, in the, everything in the glory of God fits together, the mystery of that, made me think about how a continuous um, emphasis in the Psalms, Proverbs, New Testament, early church, is the, the necessity of the attitude of thanksgiving. Because at the core of being thankful is gratitude 
to the other that gave it to us. Our, our, our Trinitarian God. Everything we have is a gift. And so how important being thankful is. And of course, the one major center of our worship is Eucharist, being thankful, you know, mm -hmm. and we kind of sometimes forget that that's what it is. And how do we grow in this thankfulness? And I, and I wonder if that's at the core of what Ignatius was, everything is a gift, everything was from God and, and being so grateful to that. Mm -hmm. We come back from the break. I do want you to talk about some of this, mm -hmm. is how one thing you've grown to after becoming a Catholic is helping people continue in Christ uh, to grow closer to that experience that Ignatius talks about as he gazes into the water along the river. So we'll come back in a moment. So uh, stay with us. We'll be back with more of uh, Mark Neal's, McNeil's story. See you later. Welcome back to The Journey Home. I'm your host, Marcus Grodi, and our guest is Mark McNeil. Before we jump back in the discussion, some of the things Mark was talking about, especially the uh, exegetical and the apologetic aspects of uh, the doctrine of the Trinity, reminds me to encourage you to go to our website, chnetwork.org. We have a forum where all these kinds of issues are discussed and bantered about for people on the journey. If you're a lifelong Catholic and you wonder, you know, how do I answer the questions when my when we're all gathered around the Thanksgiving table and somebody brings that up, well, we, we want to help you. We have resources, we have discussions, we have conversion stories, and uh, we want to encourage you to put your questions to us at chnetwork.org. Thank you. Pick up where we left off. This idea that uh, you were starting with, with your your kind of discovery and your growth in Ignatian spirituality. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned and emphasized uh, before the break uh, the importance of gratitude. Uh, and this deep sense of thankfulness. Uh, it made me think of aspects of St. Ignatius, you know, who has become, as I mentioned, uh, a very precious part of my own experience, with, along with a handful of other saints that have been deeply influential to me. Augustine and Aquinas yeah. are two great ones for me, uh, but uh, St. Ignatius is uh, uh, running a close third, if not uh, moving up there, <laughs> because uh, his own personal story is so powerful to me. But uh, but, you know, he's, his great gift to the church is the spiritual exercises, you know, his design for ideally a 30-day retreat, uh, but it can be modified in lots of different ways in daily life. And so my work over the, in recent years uh, in a Jesuit school has focused very much on uh, trying to make Ignatius accessible. And, uh, and that has caused me, of course, to pursue deeper understanding of his insights. And a number of trips to Spain have helped to stimulate my imagination and uh, and, and my love for this great saint. Uh, but in the spiritual exercise, it's really very much what it is. It's divided up into these uh, sort of four weeks, he calls them. And in the first week, it's really a, an extended reflection on the love of God that brought us into existence, and, uh, uh, but yet also the darkness of sin that has uh, alienated us or, or fractured our relationship to God. And then Ignatius calls upon us to journey with Christ. And so for weeks, uh, you spend ideally for weeks you're journeying with Christ using all the powers of the intellect, of the will, of the imagination. All these things are engaged in encountering Christ as we find Him in the Scriptures. And it's very, very powerful. I mean, the, the approach to prayer is just, uh, it's transforming to the reading of Scripture. Uh, but then when you get to the fourth week, and this is what I wanted to turn to, there is uh, one of the final uh, meditations that Ignatius invites people to is what's called the... Uh, uh, the uh, contemplatio amorum, the, the contemplation to attain the love of God. Mm -hmm. And in it, he invites the, the retreatant uh, to consider how everything that is has proceeded forth from the love of God. And so he starts by directing our attention to the lowest kinds of beings, you know, the, uh, the rocks and the dirt and, the, you know, the, 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 the sun, the moon, and the stars and those things. And then we see living things coming to be. Uh, and then finally we see animals coming to be. And then at the end of it all, 
we see the appearance of the human person. Mm -hmm. And what comes about with the appearance of the human person is something new. In all of the creation, mm -hmm. in all of the physical material world, something new comes about. Not just a creature that proceeds forth from the generosity of God, but mm -hmm. now we have a creature that not only proceeds from God's generosity and God's gift and God's graciousness and God's creativity, but we have a creature that can turn back and say thank you. And that we have something powerful and new. Now we have a creature that can turn back to its cause and to its redeemer and say thank you. And so Ignatius thinks that by an extended reflection on that, especially after journeying with Christ for weeks, now we can turn back to God and say, I give everything back to you. And he concludes with that magnificent prayer, take Lord and receive all my liberty, my memory, my understanding, my entire will, all that I have and call my own, you've given all to me. To you, O Lord, I return it. Everything is yours. Do with it what you will. Give me only your love and your grace. That is enough for me. And so that, that four weeks has prepared mm -hmm. a person ultimately to say thank you with the total return of our lives back to our cause and, and to our Redeemer. Uh, so uh, that theme that you were talking about of gratitude mm -hmm. is, uh, I mean, for Ignatius, uh, gratitude and generosity are at the, at the source of everything. I've often thought about in Philippians 4, where Paul says to rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. And then he says, have no anxiety about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, let your requests be made known to God and the peace of God, which passes all understanding will keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. It sounds good, except I, let out, I left out the key phrase. He says, have no anxiety about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. I mean, even our prayers to God, for them to be oriented correctly, our supplications, what we're asking him for, mm. to be directed correctly, need to come from mm. thanksgiving and mm. gratitude. If they're not, mm. then it's just give me, give me, or my plans. And it seems to reveal to me a, a, a real disconnect with what we really are. I mean, we are such fragile, dependent beings, and the fact that I have even another moment of breath is a gift from God. And so for me to, to be lacking in gratitude to me is, is, a, is a distance from reality. I'm not seeing the world as it really is, as a gift from God. Mark, as you look back on your journey from oneness Pentecostalism, actually Assembly of God, oneness Pentecostalism, and then into the church, is the discovery of this a great reason to come home to the church? Absolutely. I mean, the church has such an incredible tradition that, uh, you know, this was something came up at dinner last night, I think, and, uh, you know, it, in Oneness Pentecostal, a lot of beautiful people there, and, you know, wonderful people that are trying to serve God as best as they can, but there tends to be a kind of, uh, you know, very uh, rigid uh, idea of what Christian spirituality should be. This is, this is what a spiritual person is. This is what a holy person is, is they fit this, this model. One of the beauties of Catholicism is this rich array of ways in which people respond to the love of God. Uh, and it can express itself in a, in a myriad forms of spirituality, but all of those are genuine responses to the love of God. And we're all different, you know, you and I are not the same, and none of, no two of us are exactly the same. But God meets with us, and the Catholic faith is big enough, and it is beautiful enough that it takes all of our peculiarities and all of our, you know, like with the Saint Ignatius, this militant soldier, uh, it turns into a kind of battle Christianity. It's, it's being a soldier for God. Uh, and that's not exactly like a, a Francis of Assisi or, or you know, an Augustinian or a Benedictine, uh, but these are all beautiful expressions of this. So one, to me, one of the great things that I find about the Catholic faith is the beauty and the richness of the, uh, of the resources that we have for living out the faith. I think of it often like this, and this image, I, I think of it, I don't know if other people use this or not, but I came across it in a book many years ago, and I, I keep using it, and I don't hear it very much, but I find it very helpful, is that I think of the church oftentimes, especially in our times, but in all times, uh, I think of the church very much like a stained glass window. When you're looking at it from the outside on a, on a bright day, it's kind of ugly. You know, it's just a dark, dingy glass. Uh, 
But when you're looking at it from the inside, you see the light as it shines through it. You see it in its brilliance and in its glory. Uh, and I think that's how the church is oftentimes. If I, if I only knew the faith by reading the newspaper uh, or by watching the nightly news, I would, I would be out with everybody. I would be leaving with everyone else you know, that, that doesn't want to be there. Uh, but what, when I see the Catholic faith, I see it from within its riches, its beauties. If we keep our eyes on Christ, if we keep our eyes on the holy saints you know, that have lived more, more profoundly the life of grace and holiness, then how could I leave? I'm just upset with the people that mess it up, you know, and myself included. You know? How could we mar something so beautiful as this uh, by not more fully responding to it? I was thinking of stretching that analogy, which is a great one. Uh, a little bit more, if you will, that uh, at night, when you're inside a church building, those glass mm. pane are also dark and yeah. nothing. But during as the light comes out, mm -hmm. we see the beauty of it. Yeah. And to me, that's an analogy of when you're in the church going through difficult times, mm. when you seem to be in the darkness, mm. then you can forget what what the church is like mm. under the light of Christ. Yeah. And so that's why even at night in the church, you can remember what it was like in the light. Mm. So when you're in a dark time of the church. Mm. And let me ask you about that, because we are in some ways in a dark time in the church and you're teaching at an institution. And I imagine you're surrounded with questions and even doubt and struggles about how do we deal with the scandal in the church? Mm. And given your own journey, What's your thoughts on that to those watching? How do you deal with a time of darkness in the church? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. And, uh, and I think the way that I try to deal with it with students, you know, and, and colleagues, and there are people that are very unsettled, you know, they, they genuinely are very unsettled. And I find that, uh, first of all, I share in their outrage at mm -hmm. some of the things that we hear. Uh, the, I don't think that it is a, uh, you know, I think some, some righteous indignation or some genuine sense of, of holy anger uh, whenever the beautiful faith that we have is marred and covered over by so many different uh, stories that we hear. So I think sharing in and um, in some ways acknowledging the, the frustrations and the angers that are there, I think that's a, a first step. The second step is I really try to direct people to Christ and to the saints and mm -hmm. to the holy uh, you know, sources and origins of our faith. That's why I'm a Catholic. I'm a Catholic because I believe that here we can hear Christ's voice uh, down through the centuries and through his people and through the sacraments. Uh, that's why I'm a Catholic. I'm not a Catholic because, you know, we can get good headlines in the newspaper all the time. I'm a Catholic because it's here that God's grace can be found and God's love is present. And uh, so I try to, to, to reorient that. I share in your anger uh, and we don't want that. We don't want those things to be present here in the church. But they're always going to be present to some degree or another because people like us are in it. And so what I need to work on is how am I being a good example? How am I responding to the love of God and the grace of God in me? I don't want to go that way either. You know, something that's been on my mind a lot. You know, one of, one of the, the challenges, you know, here we are talking 16, 17 years later after, or, or 16 years after our original conversation. And what's life like in those intervening 16 years? Well, I get up in the morning like you do. And we, we go about doing what we do. And the challenge of being a, a Catholic Christian, uh, it seems to me, is sustaining the life of grace that we have entered into. And so the conversion story, that's fantastic. I'm grateful for God's graciousness in leading me into the church. But how am I doing as a Catholic? You know, and how am, am I allowing those little things that, that can pull us away? Am I allowing them to grow? Am I fighting against them? How's the war going on in, in the soul? I've reading, uh, been reading back through the Old Testament, and I'm in there in the story of Solomon, where it talks about how marvelously his life began. Uh, but then there's a point, it says, as he grew old, his heart was pulled away from serving God, and he began to compromise his faith, and his heart was pulled away by all the various women that entered his life, that he allowed those other religions and ideas and so on to, to destroy the simplicity of his original devotion to God. As a young man, God comes to him and says, I'll give you whatever you want. He says, just give me wisdom. I'm a child. I don't know. And so he becomes you know, known all over for his great wisdom only to be a failure in the end. Uh, and so I don't want to be that. You know, I want to I be attentive to those various ways in which we can fall from God. And uh, so I'd say in those intervening 16 years, the some of the great gifts have been to me to sustain the Christian life, 
have been people like St. Ignatius and, you know, Therese of Lisieux are simple. I'm a little flower in the field. You know, yeah. it's not all about me and learning from the saints in our tradition. And themselves uh, being in difficult times of the church. Absolutely. Sure. Yeah. Slightly different issues, but difficult times. Absolutely. You know, I know uh, one other question that I'd like to have you talk about, and that is the, the differences in liturgy and worship of God that you've experienced in your journey. You happen to come from oneness Pentecostalism into the Catholic Church. What about the differences in prayer yeah. or the difference in, the, in worshiping God, the hymnology and all that, radical uh, difference, uh, right? Uh, what, a, what a huge topic. It, it's so <laughs> different. You know, I grew up in, in Pentecostalism, where I come from, it, 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 there was, a, there was a, almost a built-in uh, resistance to form. Uh, to liturgy. We never used the word liturgy. I didn't know what that was until I uh, became exposed to Catholicism. Uh, in fact, we even sometimes became frustrated with the normal routine of our worship so that we would turn everything backward. I remember one person that just totally reversed the whole service, our worship service, uh, because he was frustrated by the fact that we was taking a form. Uh, and so we were resistant to that. We, it, we wanted to have this spontaneous movement of God's Spirit that was unpredictable, uh, that there was no form to it, there was no tradition to it. Tradition was a bad word to us. Uh, and so, now, on the other hand, we did have a form. You know, we did have a structure, and it all centered largely around worship through, through uh, stimulating music, and then that was followed by a, a typically a long uh, sermon. Uh, and, and, and what tended to happen, because there was so much emphasis placed on the sermon, uh, and there was so much emphasis placed on the emotional, you know, result of the music uh, that we tended to have very loud music. We tended to have lots of, uh, you know, exciting instruments playing along. And we also tended to have very dynamic speakers. Uh, and I got to tell you that when I became a Catholic, I enjoyed going to Mass where there weren't su such an emphasis on the yeah. dynamic speaker. Because it had become, for me, I mean, the whole thing was centered around a personality. And how powerfully they could communicate that in the Catholic tradition. I found, imagine if you were that dynamic speaker week yeah. after week, you got to be more dynamic, or at least sure. as the time because the last time, sure, there's yeah. a lot of pressure there and so much personality cult, you know. Yep. And, and the churches, in fact, we would say it that way, you know. Who, what church do you go to? I go to Brother So and So's church. It was all about yep. who was the leader in that church. Uh, it says sometimes in a very cultic way, not always, you know, they're, they're, but sometimes it was very much a, a following of this person. And uh, so, it, as you mentioned, it's hard to sustain that. You know, it's hard to sustain those emotional highs over time. And so people would tend to look for exciting new things. It was always the search for the yeah. new. And so one of the things that really was attractive to me about Catholicism, I got tired of that search for the new uh, and, and, and found in the Catholic faith a deep reservoir going into the past, you know. And so our liturgy being the product of many centuries of praying, and I, and I think, you know, the, the, this idea that the way that we pray shapes the way that we believe or shapes our thinking about things uh, is absolutely true, uh, that our praying influences or affects the way we think. The same thing, this, I think, you know, even with the reading of Scripture and with the study of Scripture, to do so within the context of the tradition, uh, to do so as a faithful believer transforms the way you look at it. Uh, it, it makes all the difference in the world. And so, uh, so anyway, that, that's a massive subject, though. And we, we uh, you know, as far as hymns and so on, we had some that we created in our own. We had some, we had some good songwriters. That our movement was relatively short-lived. And so I think there were some early attempts, you know, G.T. Haywood is one example, but there were some early attempts to write some hymns that would be comparable to, you know, sort of the mainline tradition so that we'd have some alternatives because we couldn't sing some of those songs. They were Trinitarian or otherwise. You know? Yeah. Um, yeah, Holy, Holy, Holy yeah. would have been We a, couldn't do that. We couldn't do that. We what about the Our Father? Uh, we never prayed the Our Father. Not that we would say that we wouldn't pray it, but, but we had no, you know, we were resistant to any formal things. And so when we looked okay. at the Our Father, uh, we just saw it as an outline and we would be creative with how we would deal with it. But we never would recite together a prayer like yeah, that. I was thinking the almost the exact opposite of the way you've described your one as Pentecostal worship would be kneeling before the Blessed Sacrament in the yeah. silent. Would that have been considered worship? Yeah. We had nothing comparable to it. You know, we had, well, having said that, I mean, we, we did very much emphasize prayer, uh, but prayer was, uh, 
you know, kneeling in the silence. There was there was no strong sense of sort of contemplative prayer or simply resting in the presence of Christ. Uh, it was more, uh, you know, how do I feel the, fill the time with words and how do I, you know, how do I make it exciting? And so there wasn't a strong sense of contemplative presence or certainly nothing remotely similar to a Eucharistic adoration. All right, we have an email that's from Jessica from Rockville. And uh, she writes, a few weeks ago, my husband and I met a nice couple with whom we are becoming good friends. The topic of religion has come up a few times and they don't seem to believe in the Trinity. I'm having a hard time knowing how to articulate this to fundam this fundamental Christian belief. Um, that, that's a great, great question. How do you articulate it? Uh, there are different ways you can do it. You know, one way you can, you can outline the biblical foundations that lead to the Trinity. For example, the Bible insists there's one God, but the Bible describes the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit in such a way that I can't reduce them to each other. Now, that's going to be... Uh, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are each identified as God, but I can't reduce them to each other. They interact with each other. The Father sends the Son, the Son sent by the Father. Jesus says uh, in his high priestly prayer in John 17, Father, you loved me before the creation of the world. Uh, glorify me with your own self with the glory I had with you before the creation of the world. Uh, in John 14, 15, 16, 17, and there you find lots of texts that speak of sort of interaction and interpersonal relationship between Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But I don't know if that's the best way. You know, to, to me, I find the best way to start talking about the Trinity is to say that the one God is not a solitary person, is not all alone from all eternity. You know, sometimes, you know, we would talk about God being lonely and therefore he created. God didn't create because he was lonely. God is perfect in himself. God created as a sheer act of love, of overflowing love, uh, by giving us existence when we had no entitlement to it and there was no need of it. And so God is absolutely perfect in himself. If he's perfect in himself, uh, then, and, and God is not, we do not understand God to be this isolated solitariness, but instead God is infinite perfect love. And that's what makes the, the oneness of God what it is. A thing is one to the degree that it's inseparable. You know, this is one glass that I have here, but I could go throw it on the ground outside and it'll shatter into many pieces. Uh, the Bible that you have there is, is one Bible, but it's made up of many pages. And we could fairly easily take those apart as well. Uh, the more two are one, or three are one, or four are one, or whatever, the harder it is to divide them and to separate them. And so the scripture says that when a husband and wife leave father and mother, the two become one flesh. Uh, and so there's a greater, an even greater unity and oneness that exists there than in just a collection of people standing around on a street corner. Uh, so the, the, the greater the oneness, the harder to divide it. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, the oneness there is so supreme, so perfect, so eternal, so uh, unchangeable, that the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit simply cannot possibly be thought of apart from each other. I can't think of the Father separated from the Son if I understand what I mean by Father and Son. It doesn't mean that they're exactly the same. We can distinguish between them, but they are inseparable. And so the oneness of God is a oneness of inseparability. Now, and I would return to this point. What I always want to return to when talking about the Trinity, especially getting, getting people used to the idea of the Trinity, is that ultimately the Trinity is the mystery that at the root and the heart of everything, if we could roll back the curtain to all of reality, we would see love in its infinite, most perfect form, and that is God. Yeah, and again, that mystery, almost what separates the, the journeying Catholic in this mystery and the non-Catholic is often non-Catholic traditions get caught up in either ors, mm. either ors. And the Catholic is, it's a both and, there's both ands. Um, and so, and it's a growing appreciation of the mystery of, of, of God's total sovereignty, and yet our complete freedom of will. How is that possible? It's a both and. It's not either or. Either or you end up with Calvinism or Wesleyanism at, each, at either sides of the, of the boxing rink. It's a both and, right? I mean, the, the both, even mis the mystery of Ignatian prayer gets into this, the beauty of, of our freedom and yet our total dependence uh, on God's mercy. Wish we had another hour for that. Oh, we'll have you back. All right. Um, that book you just came out, what's the name of it again? All in the Name. All right. And that's Catholic Answers Press, right? 
Mark, thank you very much. Thank you, Marcus. For joining us on the program, and God bless you in the work that you continue to do, and especially adult catechesis and drawing them in, in deeper spirituality. Thank you. Thank Mark. you. And thank you for joining us on this episode of The Journey Home. I uh, hope Mark's journey uh, and his discussion of the Trinity challenged you uh, to appreciate this great faith that we've been given, and it's uh, something we're to be grateful for. Uh, and again, I encourage you to check out our website, the Coming Home Network International, chnetwork.org. More stories like Mark, including his story, as well as resources to help you on your journey. God bless you. See you again next week.